1977, Elizabeth II, Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, celebrated her silver jubilee. She had been 25 when she ascended the throne, but the euphoria which greeted the beginning of her reign as a second Elizabethan age had long since disappeared, blown away by the winds of change. Monarchy could still put on a good show, but there could be no pretending that Britain's power was as it once had been when the monarch was the titular head of the greatest empire the world has known. Elizabeth inherited the throne the minute her father, King George VI, died in the early hours of February 6, 1952. She was some 4,000 miles away in East Africa at the time, and she returned at once to the ancient rituals which ensured her succession. With one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the high and mighty princess, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary, is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become Queen Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, Queen of this realm. God save the Queen. So Elizabeth Alexandra Mary becomes Elizabeth II, Queen of England, succeeding to one of the oldest thrones in the world, a monarchy that has withstood the buffets of time, for which great battles have been fought, great men and women contended. She has one unique advantage over her father. Although she never sought the job, she has been trained for it, as few people have been in this century. And now she succeeds not only to the facade of power, but to a unique position within the British Constitution, which could be summed up in the words, the Queen in Parliament is supreme. Each time a new government comes to power in Britain, it publishes its program in the ceremony known as the State Opening of Parliament. Wearing the imperial state crown, the monarch goes to Westminster to express, through her own person, 
the concept of parliamentary sovereignty, which is Britain's form of constitutional monarchy. State opening of Parliament really symbolizes the ancient union between the monarch and Parliament, at which, in which at one time the monarch was the dominant power, but which now, of course, is very much the opposite. Parliament is the dominant power. My lords, pray be seated. The Queen and her consort, Prince Philip, take their place in the chamber of the House of Lords. Here they wait for the elected representatives of the people, the members of the House of Commons, who are formally summoned by the gentleman usher of the Black Rod. As Black Rod approaches, the doors of the chamber are closed against him. He knocks three times to demand entry. This is a reassertion of the freedom of the Commons, which originated after Charles I tried to arrest some of the members. Advancing to the bar of the House, he bows three times. Mr. Speaker, the Queen commands this Honorable House to attend Her Majesty immediately in the House of Peers. These ancient symbols and old offices seem to me to represent the continuity, not only of the Crown, but of British government. And we must accept, we must reckon that this is something worthwhile. Make way for Black Rod. Make way for Mr. Speaker. The Speaker is still the man that was the Speaker 300 years ago, that has the same powers, the same influence, that Black Rod is still there, that the, the guard shall be changed at Buckingham Palace. But these are part of a continuity that is almost unique in the modern world and therefore, I believe, has helped Britain to survive. My lords and members of the House of Commons, my government will give their full support. The speech from the throne, as it is called, has been written by the Prime Minister of the day. The Queen is obliged to read it. She has no constitutional power to take any independent role in politics, but must always do what her ministers advise her to do. If the people don't like it, then it's her ministers who will be thrown out, not her. At home, we have this strange euphemism that the Prime Minister advises the Queen. What really happens is that the Prime Minister says, Ma'am, this is the policy which I am going to follow and to which you will agree. My Lords and members of the House of Commons, I pray that the blessing of Almighty God may rest upon your councils. Winston Churchill was Queen Elizabeth's first Prime Minister. A devoted monarchist, he was the first to acknowledge the Queen's right to be kept informed about all matters of importance. In his young and attractive sovereign, Churchill saw a form of power which was above politics. In our island, by trial and error, and by perseverance across centuries, we have found out a very good plan. Now, uh, here it is. The Queen can do no wrong. <laughs> hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! The link between Buckingham Palace and Downing Street is as close as monarch and prime minister choose to make it. Ultimately, every act of the government must have the Queen's sanction. She, in turn, must keep abreast of events by reading state papers and by regular meetings with her Prime Minister. It must be assumed that Churchill's successor, Antony Eden, told her in advance of what proved to be a turning point in her reign, the ill-fated attempt to topple Nasser of Egypt by launching an invasion of the Suez Canal. We cannot allow, we could not allow, a conflict in the Middle East to spread. Our survival as a nation depends on oil, and nearly three quarters of our oil comes from that part of the world. The Suez undoubtedly was a watershed in British history because it demonstrated that Britain and France were no longer capable of independent use of power. Suez forced Eden to resign and the Queen was then required to play a decisive part in choosing his successor. The situation was controversial, as it seemed to involve the Crown in partisan politics. 
To avoid this, the major parties in Britain have adopted their own procedures for nominating their leaders. Although the Queen's right to choose her own prime minister in theory remains, it's an emergency power only for use in a crisis. After Eden, the Queen sent for Harold Macmillan. This afternoon, the Queen did me the great honor to ask me to form a government. I have accepted this duty. The occasion is a sad one for me, brought about as it is by the retirement of my old and very dear friend, Anthony Eden. I'm sure there isn't any one of you who would not join with me in wishing him good health and a speedy recovery. We have a difficult task before us in this country, all of us, and it will need our courage and our strength. Well, Harold Macmillan, of course, took over from Eden at a very low point in Anglo-American relations and, in fact, a low point in British fortunes. He succeeded by very adroit diplomacy and by a considerable use of the Queen as a symbol in restoring the old friendship. The Queen went to the United States on a, on a visit, which was a huge success. Her travels have given the Queen an experience which is of considerable value to her ministers, the more so as she grows older. In the loose association of republics and dominions which make up the British Commonwealth, the Queen also has her uses which go beyond those of any other head of state. In this modern age, the strength and unity of the Commonwealth family does not lie in bonds forged by formal instruments, nor in common ancestry, nor in pursuing the same political line. It springs from the knowledge that we all share a lively concern for individual freedom and all the machinery which makes this possible. There are several expressions of this unity. As the head of the Commonwealth, I am one. During Queen Elizabeth's reign, Britain's mighty imperial power has dramatically declined. The Queen's visits to former dependencies like Ghana have helped Britain disengage from commitments while retaining influence. This being from really from as far as the Ghanaians are concerned out of space comes there adorned in the court dresses and the crown. They'd never seen anything like that before. They loved it. And the, the visit was a huge success. They showered her with adulation. Macmillan, of course, went to Africa and it was in Africa that he made his famous Winds of Change speech which keynoted that entire period of British history. And nowhere did those winds of change blow more fiercely than in Kenya, where Jomo Kenyatta had once been damned by the whites as the most dangerous man in Africa. Macmillan did use the crowd to accelerate the change and to make the British people like it. And so we see the Union Jack being lowered uh, from Flagstaff's halfway across the world. In Britain and countries like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, the crown is an abstract idea signifying the powers of the state. But in Queen Elizabeth's reign, newsreel and television coverage has exposed the person of the monarch as never before. Performing official duties so much in the public eye has given her a deceptive appearance of power. One must remember that that's the facade of power it isn't power itself and that sooner or later in these visits 
There is a dinner or a luncheon at Downing Street in which the visitor comes face to face with the realities of power in Britain, which is the prime minister and the party in power. As an hereditary head of state, the queen brings a mystical allure to her functions, which is a form of power her ministers have not hesitated to exploit. They hoped it would charm de Gaulle out of his chronic Anglophobia. Of course, with all this, it was a spectacular visit. It didn't budge de Gaulle's opposition, first to Britain joining the common market, and secondly, his intention of pulling France out of military integration with NATO. It was not until after de Gaulle's death that Britain's entry into the common market was finally secured by another prime minister, Edward Heath, as a logical end to the winds of change which had blown away Britain's empire. The last half century has been a traumatic period for Britain. A world war which tried her to the utmost, a great social revolution after that war, great changes in British society, including immigration, which changed the ethnic makeup of Britain, uh, troubles in Ireland, uh, troubles between Labour and Parliament. Now, she has managed to withstand these, and it's possible, in fact, I think highly probable, the reason she has is that there's been a focus for loyalty above politics, the focus being the Crown. There has also been a sense of continuity, again, in the Crown and the monarchy that has enabled the British to withstand these blows to their psyche, which are greater, I suppose, for them than for any other country in Europe. During the Queen's reign, the face of Britain's governing classes, sometimes called the establishment, has also changed. One of the secrets of Britain, I think, is this mobility beyond this unchanging facade, this change in which new people, new classes, enter the establishment, become ennobled or become accustomed to the, the uses of power and therefore are able in time to take its place. There's nothing new about this. What was new, however, was that in 1979, Britain became the first country in Europe to have a woman as prime minister. A tribute, no doubt, to the fact that for the previous quarter century, the British people had grown accustomed to their queen as a successful head of state. Ask it, the garden parties, those are expected. It's the less advertised contacts with the people that I think count the most. However, she or the people around her who who manage the monarchy are smart enough to know that you can't do this too often. You don't let the light in too often or you lose the mystique. The mystique is that of tradition. At the annual parade when the Queen's guards troop the color before Her Majesty, their colonel in chief. Trooping the color I think provides the British people with a sort of cover for what they know really has happened, which is that British power has withered in the last 25 years. That the Royal Navy, which was once the most powerful in the world, is now reduced to a few score surface combatants and six nuclear submarines. That the, uh, the Royal Air Force is short of aircraft and short of pilots that the three services in the last 10 years have been starved of money and consequently have had great difficulty in holding on to their, their best men, uh, officers, non-commissioned officers, and uh, soldiers, sailors, men. This can all be covered up by this wonderful bit of pageantry called Trooping the Color. And of course, it's made more palatable because the people who are doing it are probably the best infantry in Europe, the Guards regiments. But it doesn't change the realities of what has happened to British power in the last 25 years. The 
when we look at the Queen, we always have to distinguish between the lay figure in her robes and crown and the woman beneath. The woman who is a mother, who has had difficulties with an errant sister, who longs to see her children grow up without being in the public eye too much. She knows that she must assume these things, but she doesn't think they have to. On the other hand, she is smart enough to realize that the Prince of Wales, Charles, must be brought along to take, eventually take her job. All she can do is to see that Charles is Prince of Wales, to show him how she does her job and hope that in time he will do it as well. It will be difficult to do it any better. We have this peculiar combination of power and influence. Power which the queen does not wield. Influence which she may wield to an extent far greater than we know. That influence comes from the coupling of experience over 25 years with her prime ministers by a woman of considerable intelligence and a retentive memory. Who can tell today how much the advice that she may give out of her past experience weighs with her present ministers? At any rate, I think we must assume that this influence of the Queen is part of this peculiar combination which has allowed Britain to weather the winds of change, winds which in the last 25 years have shaken so many other governments around the world.